Hi guys, Jonathan Ferguson, Keeper of Firearms and Artillery, here in one of my favourite places, one of our firearms stores. And I have another rather splendid piece to show you today, about which we know relatively little, but I think we know enough to be able to explain why it looks like this. <laughs> so, uh, to start off, this is, this is French. Um, it's not that unconventional, if we ignore this for the moment, so the, the stocking arrangements are fairly typically, typically French. Um, Charleville, model 1777 onwards, that general style lasted for, well, into the breech loading period with conversions as we've seen on this channel. Uh, the butt plate is conventional, 1777 style. The furniture, the barrel bands are the iron version of the 1777 style. The nose cap is a bit different, a lot different actually. It's lacking that classic uh, French nose cap. I'll just quickly show you what I mean. So here is a 1777. You can see the, uh, the color of the wood's different. This is actually an experimental oak stock on this one, which is interesting in itself. But the same butt plate, same stock. The, tr the thing below, um, below shot that we're looking at today is missing these finger grooves on the trigger guard because the whole trigger guard is different, I'll show you in a minute. But apart from that, it has similar barrel bands, albeit this has the modified spring clip arrangement that came in later. Same one there. And that's where it differs at the front. Doesn't have that enclosing nose cap with the sight on it that we know from, from traditional French um, flip lock and percussion arms. So that's the conventional Charleville out of the way. Back to this thing. So I mentioned the trigger guard. It has the flared French look to it, but it's drastically offset. Um, and that's because the trigger is drastically offset. Oh, and by the way, that means, well, not necessarily, they could have included the, the tang with the finger grooves, but they didn't, it's not on there. So this is all different. And this is to accommodate, to guard, to do, do its best to guard this bizarre trigger, which we'll see on the table in a moment. But as you can see, it acts backwards. And then we have what we have is, all external lock work, which is key to, to the story here. Um, we'll look at, look at how this works, as I say, in a second, but I just want to give you the background. Now, dates-wise, conveniently, on the cock is marked 1790. So we have a date for this thing. Um, and we have another date, which is 1815. It has certain historical significance to it, and it's not coincidental. That's when this thing um, first appears in a museum inventory, having presumably been captured, not in battle, I, I very much doubt, but from one of the arsenals where it would have been kept for reference, I assume, because this is an attempt to create a lock mechanism, not that anyone can make, but that a gun lock maker doesn't have to make, if that makes sense. So normally you'd be reliant upon specialist barrel makers, Fairly specialist stock makers, although that's a, com a, com a compromise you could make, is to get a carpenter to turn up some rough gun stocks for you. And then critically, the lock maker, who um, shared some skills and, and almost certainly originated with the door lock maker, the chest lock maker, all the same set of skills. And we know that in America, in the colonies um, at the time, um, not then, uh, they did do both. Some communities, some, some makers could make all types of locks. Anyway, that's a bit off the point because what we're interested in here is a completely reinvented flintlock that especially the by then specialist gun lock maker wasn't needed for, which means in times of crisis, last ditch scenario, uh, tight supply lines, whatever the situation may be, you could go to someone called a whitesmith, who is the metal worker and blacksmiths will hate me for saying this, but one up from a blacksmith. So the, the blacksmith would produce um, some potentially quite beautiful objects, often quite functional. Uh, whatever they whatever they were, they were created black from the forge. Um, white metal, uh, you'll, you've heard the expression in the white, I suspect. That's a metal, metal part that has been uh, filed, ground, polished, but not finished. And sometimes, as in this case, um, or some of the parts anyway, um, they're left in the white and you maintain them with oil or something uh, rather than 
finishing them with blue or browning or something like that. So they're related terms. In the white relates to the state of the metal and a whitesmith is someone who they might take a, a rough forging from a blacksmith or they would almost certainly have the skill to forge it themselves and then they would grind, file, polish, fit, um, possibly decorate, although they probably for decoration other than putting on um, government mandated markings or something, they would send that on to, to an engraver. Think of it one way or another as a cottage industry. Some countries organized uh, more than others and at different times. Um, nonetheless, so this was redesigned from scratch from the conventional lock mechanism. Just a reminder of what a conventional lock looks like. Redesigned to be made by a whitesmith. At least that's what the uh, one of my forebears at the Royal Artillery Museum said when they described this as, in their 1815 inventory, a French project of a musket proposed during the revolution with the lock constructed in such a manner that every whitesmith might be able to make one. And it says ramrod wanting because someone had lost the ramrod at some point. <laughs> um, so that's all we know about it. But we combine that with the date on the cop, which tells us when it was actually made. The idea that it, or the suggestion that the idea was proposed in the French Revolution. Um, we have to take this person's word on that, but they're very close to the time. It's perfectly possible he spoke to someone at the arsenal, wherever this came from, and or, or it's also possible that they surmised that that's where this came from. Um, a national government, a time, time of stress, turning to an alternative solution. And I, whatever the truth is, I suspect that's close to it because I have never seen anywhere else a lock that looks like this. And I think you would have to be under some extreme economic pressure to come up with this. It's insane, <laughs> frankly, but very cool and very historic. So there we are, guys. I don't know what to call this. I don't think it has a designation. Um, but the French clock spring musket is what I'm, gonna, I'm going to call it. Um, I think this is particularly fascinating because whereas the normal musket's gun lock connects to the work of door lock makers, um, historically, this is a tangible link to the work of clock spring makers. Um, one of the skills of a whitesmith in the 18th and early 19th century, 19th century generally was that they were skilled enough to heat treat springs, create and heat treat springs. The absolute beating heart of any mechanism, but especially a flintlock that really needs that beefy spring to function, is a spring. And the, the sort of mobile strip coil spring that is a cock spring wouldn't normally find its home on a firearm. Um, funnily enough, there's a, there's a later reflection of this with the Lewis gun recoil spring, which is in a little housing and is also a wind-up spring. Um, there's also a clock-type spring in the Collier flintlock revolver, but there aren't many. Generally speaking, you want a V-shaped, properly heat-treated, very strong, normal mainspring, and then one for the frizzing at the front as well. So this is pivoting to the skills needed to make a clock <laughs> to essentially keep your, your national arsenal rolling, manufacturing, putting together muskets. It's a workaround, a very interesting one. Right, here is this thing on the bench. Now, the, one of the strange features is this big spur on the cock. Uh, it's actually part of the top jaw here. Now this is necessary because although this isn't any stronger than the V-shaped mainspring on a normal flintlock, to make this work, if we ignore for the moment the frizzing, to make this work, you have to pull it back to either the half cock or the full cock position and hold it there while you put the trigger in place, which is ridiculous, frankly. And I'm sure people at the time thought likewise. Um, that's why this is there. With a, with a normal lock, you simply pull it back till it clicks, just like a, a hammer on a modern firearm. Um, with this, because the trigger is sprung the other way, 
because of the way this is all set up, you have to hold, put, you have to manually reset your trigger. It's a bit like if the trigger spring breaks on your pistol, you have to manually push the trigger forward to re-engage the sear. Well, with this, you have to do it every time. So if you want to put it in half cock, you can. That's that notch there. But I don't know why you would, because you then have to hold it back, push the trigger forward again, and then put it on full cock. So your normal safety procedure is kind of compromised by that. Um, but having said that, looking at these, these notches, these bents, you'll see half cock is far deeper than full cock. So really the only safe way to carry this is quite a light trigger, quite a light trigger indeed for a musket. So you'd have to carry it on half cock. You'd also need it on half cock in order to hold open the frizzen while you pour in your priming powder, which is a real pain. And I don't know how you would do this without three hands actually holding it at the hip or the waist for reloading. Anyway, this is how it works. Um, really quite ingenious, a way to get your lock made by non-specialist gun lock makers um, in the late 18th century. So all that would leave, of course, with a primed pan and a fully cocked, manually set lock. You can see how this thing moves around its axis because of this coil spring, really quite janky to use the modern vernacular um, so that's it on full cock and to fire it and this thing would would spark up if i were to pull the trigger but what i'll do is hold it back um hold it i'll hold just basically take the spring strain and then pull the trigger and you see it still wants to leap forward out of my fingers there i'm straining to hold it and then the flint would strike the steel which i'll manually pull out the way the cock whiff would come down, the sparks would light the priming charge and your musket would fire. And then we, what we have to do in this museum context is lower the steel down onto the top jaw screw because there's no other way to leave this at rest um, without damaging slightly the mechanism. So there we are. I hope you found that interesting. Um, we do this every week, as, as I'm sure most of you know by now, if you're new, hello. Um, you can also catch me over on the GameSpot channel, talking about guns and video games. And as always, in the description are links to our website, uh, ways to donate, help out. We have shop, we have social media. Um, go and check it all out. Please do come and visit one of our museums if you can. Thanks, guys.